This video is sponsored by NordPass, a new service powered by the more popular NordVPN service. NordPass not only generates highly complex passwords instantly, but also autofills and autosaves them, utilizing top of field encryption technology. In other words, that whole remember my password link that you always click on hesitantly, but do it anyway because you're too lazy to type in your password every single time can be done directly through NordPass but with significantly more security, all the while containing a more complex password that can be generated with just the click of a button. Like you literally just click and log in with one master password for everything without even having to think about anything else at all. And also, while still protecting all of your passwords and personal account information better than you ever could on your own before. Not to mention, you'll never have to worry about forgetting or losing your password ever again. NordPass takes care of all of that and works on pretty much every single internet browser, even some of those old weird ones that barely anyone even uses anymore. Oh, and don't worry, your mobile devices can be protected as well. You can get 50% off of the already ridiculously low price, plus an additional month for free if you use my promo code FROMNOTHING. Or just go to nordpass.com slash fromnothing, which I'll leave a link to below. So basically you'll be getting this awesome service for just $2.49 a month, all the while supporting the continuation and growth of From Nothing in the process. Everybody wins. Hello everyone, it's Jabbar here. Today's video is a patron request. If you would like to make a video request of your own, you can do so by becoming a patron. The link to this can be found below. In regards to the indigenous African warfare, there is a popular misconception that the examples of tribal warfare that we witnessed throughout the 20th century offer a snapshot or direct continuation of the indigenous institutions that existed on the continent prior to the influence of Europeans. From the noble European knight to the fierce Japanese samurai, their armor is glorified as the epitome of military excellence in the Middle Ages. Meanwhile, Africans are often looked upon as scattered agglomerations of small groups of men armed with spears and wearing nothing more than loincloths. However, these small-scale village wars are nothing more than an insignificant fragment that merely existed in the shadows of once great kingdoms and empires, many of which had warriors fully equipped with excellent arms and armor. Not only did they prove to be formidable on the battlefield against their neighbors, but also against the Europeans, making any real attempt at conquest nearly impossible until the 19th century, with the advent of modern weaponry such as repeating rifles, machine guns, and explosive artillery. One notable feature that distinguished African armor traditions from those of Eurasia, however, is that virtually the whole of the continent is in the tropics, and thus metal armor was not common. Like seriously, my car gets hot enough to burn my hand in the summer. Imagine wearing a full suit of that stuff on your body in Africa. However, though it was uncommon, it doesn't mean it didn't exist at all. So from simple wrappings of cloth around the body to expertly crafted steel chest plates, we'll cover some of the various armor traditions throughout the history of Africa. Perhaps the part of Africa that hosted the most widespread use of armor and the largest variety was West Africa, particularly the Sahelian region. Fueled by a relatively continuous stretch of flat, grassy plains from the Atlantic coast of Africa all the way to the Indian Ocean coast. As a result, various cavalry states dominated this region throughout history, including the largest empires in the history of the continent. Many of these were renowned for dressing themselves and occasionally their horses in armor. Perhaps the most prevalent type of armor of this region consisted of densely woven cloth and textiles of varying styles and designs, similar to the European gambeson or the Mesoamerican armor. Among the most simplistic of these designs was that of the Mosi, who were known to wrap their bodies in layer upon layer of cloth before battle. In roughly the 16th century, the Jolof states were also known to use this technique, wrapping their chest and abdomen with dense textiles so that no weapon can pierce them. However, shifting farther east to the Chadian kingdoms such as those of the Hausa, Bagrimi, and Bornu, there were much stronger and more well-developed traditions of armor use, so strong in fact that it can still be seen today for ceremonial purposes. Heavy cavalry frequently consisted of warriors wearing full cloaks of thick cloth. This armor could either be made from densely wadded cotton or constructed in a quilt-like fashion, with each section being filled with a dense protective material. It has been noted by observers that the density and heaviness of the armor of the House of Warriors from the Kingdom of Kano was so cumbersome that the rider had to be assisted by two men just to mount his horse. Armor of this style and technique extended all the way over to the Horn of Africa, which is where it may have possibly originated. 
notably from the peoples of Sudan, whom have been economically and culturally linked to the peoples of Eurasia since antiquity via the Nile River Valley. Another potential originator of the Sahelian armor traditions is that of the Kanem Bornu Empire, one of the Chadian empires that bordered the aforementioned Hausa kingdoms. It was also one of Africa's largest empires in history that dominated the whole of the Lake Chad region with varying degrees of dominion in a period spanning roughly 1,000 years. African armor diffusing from this region is a personal theory of mine due to the, just the sheer diversity and frequency of armor use in this region, as well as the gradual radiant of armor use as one travels farther away in the eastward and westward directions. Like the Hausa, the people of Kanem Bornu traditionally wore cotton-based armor. However, several other forms of armor existed throughout the empire, including chainmail and perhaps the only indigenous instance of plate armor in all of Africa. Though sources are scarce, a few surviving examples of this steel plate armor in photos offer an invaluable view of this African tradition. It appears that it was solely a protective cuirass, with the remainder of the warrior's body being dressed in either chainmail, cotton armor, or a simple unarmored shirt. Horses of the Kanem Bornu and other surrounding peoples would have been dressed in cotton armor with protective metal plates distributed throughout the body. Askia Ishak II of the Songhai Empire is said to have worn a steel chest plate during a civil war in 1588, though details on its origin are not specified. And it could have potentially been acquired from the aforementioned Kanem Bornu Empire or from Europeans that had recently begun trading heavily in the region. Unfortunately, it has been next to impossible to discover more details on it, but as per usual, sources that I do have will be cited on my website. Despite the use of plate armor, chainmail was still the most common type of armor worn by the heavy cavalry of Kanem Bornu and surrounding states, despite offering less protection and being more expensive and laborious to manufacture. This was most likely due to the physical toll that metal plate armor must have taken on warriors fighting under the hot African sun. While chainmail was present in West Africa, it was a lot less common as one sees a rough transition from textile-based armor to metal armor as one moves from the west to the east. However, there are some exceptions such as the warriors of the Oyo Empire who were known to have worn chainmail armor, likely imported from industries located further to the east, like the Omdurman industry that existed in what is now modern-day Sudan. This industry practiced a tradition of armor smithing that involved three men, two of which created links consisting of five rings, while the master armorer joined these links together to create a suit of chainmail. This tradition involved the use of wedge-shaped links, which were notably distinct from the mail used in medieval Europe. It was worn in battle as recently as the year 1898 in the Battle of Omdurman, while the armor itself continued to be manufactured locally as recently as 1940 for ceremonial purposes. Despite the fact that quilted cloth armor was worn in the region as well, perhaps the most excellent example of a completely indigenous type of African armor would be that of the Benin Empire. And when I say completely indigenous, this is not to say that the other examples mentioned before aren't because they definitely were. However, the armor created in Benin shows virtually no signs of outside influence and seems to be perfectly designed and fine-tuned for use in the hot and humid tropics of West Africa, all the while providing maximum protection as well as mobility, an absolute necessity in forest warfare. While the armor worn by the warriors of the empire varied dramatically, there are a few key characteristics that were nearly universal. Typically, the torso was protected by a garment that resembled a cross between an apron and a vest, and could be crafted from various types of leather, including that derived from cattle, leopards, elephants, crocodiles, and pangolin scales. Metal objects such as bells and charms were also strewn across the garment offering additional protection, but were mostly used for spiritual purposes and psychological warfare. The legs were protected down to the knees and occasionally as low as the ankles with a kilt-like garment, presumably composed of similar materials. Helmets, which protected the cranium, were frequently composed of these materials as well. Many of them included a metal forehead brim, or in some cases, the entire helmet was completely made of bronze, loosely resembling those worn by the ancient Greeks or Romans, or the Inca. Densely woven palm fronds and textiles may have also been used. Unfortunately, as per usual, with no surviving examples of this armor, much of what we know about it comes from what can be interpreted from the various works of art created by the Edo people. Most of those are composed of wood, ivory, and bronze, and date back to the Middle Ages. The vast majority of them depict highly detailed images of these warriors in a period spanning roughly between the 15th and 20th centuries, and possibly earlier. And uh, not gonna lie, I personally think that the Benin warriors had some of the most awesome looking armor I've ever seen. Anyway, thanks for watching guys, and remember, this was a patron request. If you'd like to make a video request of your own, you can do so at the link down below.
and don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. Also, please be safe out there during this pandemic. I know it's hard not to go crazy during this time, but anytime you begin to worry or feel down or lost, just know that we're all in this together. Whether you're black, white, American, Nigerian, Chinese, Swedish, doesn't matter. This is something that's affecting all of us human beings, and it really goes to show you just how often we overlook how much we have in common through the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'll see you guys next time, and always remember, we don't come from nothing.